Good evening and welcome to the mayoral and aldermanic district two candidate forums sponsored by the Sheboygan branch of the American Association of University Women. AAUW seeks to empower girls and women and promote equity for girls and women through advocacy, education and research. We are a nonpartisan organization. We do not endorse candidates, but we do take positions on issues and have been instrumental in legislation for improved opportunities for women and girls. Our local branch also gives a $2,500 scholarship every year to a non-traditional woman student who has returned to work, to school. The moderator for the mayoral forum is Mike Clausen. He is not an AUW member, but his wife is. And the timekeeper is Linda Bolgert. The aldermanic forum will immediately follow the mayoral forum. The mayoral candidates are Ryan Sorensen and Mike Vandersteen. Hello, welcome. Thank you for making yourselves available to go through these important issues and thank you to everybody watching at home. I'm sorry we couldn't have you here in person. We decided in advance that we would alternate questions starting with Ryan Sorensen. So let me get right into it. The most pressing issue of the last 15 months is undoubtedly the global pandemic of the COVID-19 virus. With the introduction of effective vaccines, we're in a much more secure position today than we were last year, but the disruption will take time to heal. Last week, the American Rescue Plan was passed into law, providing funding support for local government expenses, education, small business, renters, and more. As mayor, what do you plan to do to access this support? Well, first off, I'd like to thank the AAUW for hosting this forum tonight. I'm excited to share my vision and ideas for a, a fresh new leadership for the city of Sheboygan. To the, the, the question, this has been a huge uh, topic that's been discussed with a lot of business owners that I've been working with and talking to throughout this campaign. And quite frankly, we're still not out of the woods just yet. I'm glad Congress passed the American Rescue Plan um, and a lot of their funds that they're using are targeted for municipalities specifically, as well as um, housing assistance, as well as business support system. I think it's vital that the city, the city government, as well as the mayor, take a key role in ensuring that we're communicating, working with directly with businesses, and working with our key partnerships across this area, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce, whether it's the Business Improvement District, um, and other neighborhood associations as well that have connections with local businesses, ensuring that we're getting this money out to them, to businesses that are in need, to families that are still struggling, to folks that are struggling to pay their rent. This pandemic has hurt every single one of us in many different ways, and it's vital that the, the city steps up and uh, is a key leader in getting that information out there and connecting those with the resources that need it. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Vandersteen, same question. Thank you very much, and I also want to thank the AUW for organizing this event. Um, the uh, American Recovery Program that, uh, that was just passed is something that, uh, that I've lobbied for in Congress for, for some time. I've written letters to Congressman um, and, and House Leader Pelosi and some of her associates. I've uh, gotten online with some of our congressional representatives, encouraging them to uh, give the city some direct support. You know, we uh, did get some money to help us with COVID expenses, but uh, we really didn't get any money to help us out with revenue replacement. And as of last September, we, we had accounted uh, for about $1.2 million in lost revenues to the city of Sheboygan. And that's gonna be a big impact on our upcoming budget because we had to uh, scramble and find other ways to cover those expenses without the revenues that we normally had. So as far as the COVID in general, you know, we've tried to uh, put together some really great programs uh, for our uh, businesses. So there's uh, two rounds that we did of, of funding for businesses that were five or under employees so that they could make it through this uh, COVID period and then come back and, and be great businesses in Sheboygan as time goes on. And we're also worrying about 
a residence. So we also put together uh, a mortgage assistance program that can help some of the low income people out so that they can maintain their ownership of their home and again survive this COVID period. And the state has got a great program in place right now to help people out with rental assistance. So there is help out there. And one of the problems I see is a lot of people don't want to ask for the help. Uh, so I, I hope that they, they'd let their, their pride go a little bit and take advantage of the dollars that we put together because we really like to push all of it out the door and help as many people as we can to survive this, this COVID pandemic that we've had in the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question will go to Mike first. Uh, President Biden declared that by the 4th of July, it should be possible to gather and celebrate in small groups so do you expect that our annual parade can go forward with modifications such as a longer route to spread out the crowds or something else? Well, I just had the pleasure of making an announcement at the last council meeting that Visit Sheboygan and Sheboygan have decided to begin the planning for this event. Uh, if we don't start planning it now, we won't be able to pull it off on a very short time frame later on. Uh, but, you know, we've had a great downward trend in the trajectory in the, in the city of Sheboygan in the county with, uh, with cases that we have. And the last I looked, we were about 160 uh, for, um, per 100,000 people of burden rate. And we need to get under 100 to be in the medium range. Right now we're in the high range. So we're hoping that we can accomplish that and that'll uh, open up the door for everything to, to happen as it normally has in the past. But we'll be encouraging people to maintain what social distance they can, to, to wear a mask when they're close to others. Uh, extending the parade route is something that definitely we can consider. Uh, so all of those things are on the table and, and we will make a final decision as we get closer to that actual event as to whether or not it, it's going to be held and what parts of it will be held. So it might be possible to maybe have the fireworks, but maybe not a parade. So we'll have to see. We're also moving ahead with uh, plans to conduct the Memorial Day parade as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ryan? I would uh, agree with Mayor Vandersteen as well. Um, the point is we're still not out of the woods just yet with this pandemic, so it's vitally important that we ensure that folks get the vaccine so that we can get to that point so that we can have a safe 4th of July. 4th of July is one of my favorite holidays, so I want the parade and I want all the events just as much as everyone else does. Um, but um, we gotta make sure we're playing it smart, we're doing it right. I think there have been some other communities that we can look at that have successfully pulled off events during the pandemic that have done it safely and effectively. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that you know the, the numbers will continue to decrease, we get the vaccines rolling out there, um, people still um, mask up and uh, social distance so that we can have the 4th of July parade. And that's something I'm looking forward to and I know everyone else in the city is. Thank you. Uh, research has been done and studies have shown that diversity can be an important part of good decision making. Bringing in different experiences and outlooks make sure that more viewpoints are represented in the decisions we make race, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, education, living with a disability. Diversity has many, many expressions. Sheboygan is becoming a much more diverse community, which should bring more diversity in hiring, appointments to advisory boards, decision-making boards. What will you do as mayor to encourage inclusion? I think this is an awesome topic and this has been a huge issue um, that a lot of folks have been talking about, whether it's students in our school district, whether it's local business owners, um, and just folks all over the city. I think it's vitally important, again, that the mayor is, is a role and a leader in addressing our diverse community and just, quite frankly, the diverse talent that we have with everybody that makes up our community. Um, I, I've been a founding member of the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and, Inclusion and Belonging Initiative working with other uh, community leaders all across Sheboygan County to address some of these key key issues. Um, and I'm on the city subcommittee for that group as well. We look at different practices that the city can implement, whether it's around hiring, whether it's around appointments to boards and commissions, um, and also engaging with other folks throughout the process. Um, the more voices and ideas that you have at a table, the better ideas that you uh, can uh, bring together and you have a stronger output um, so I, I see the role as, as the mayor to address this issue by elevating the voices, ensuring that any appointment reflects um, the key diversity of our community and city as well. Um, 
in, in just uh, ensuring that, that those voices are heard, I know that we'll be continuing to make Sheboygan a more welcoming, inclusive place. But we also need to work, look at how um, lack of diversity and inclusion impacts our workforce. A lot of folks, um, are, a lot of business leaders are struggling to hire diverse talent and grow their businesses because we're not a welcoming, inclusive community in some parts. So there's work to do, um, and, and I would look forward to, to making a huge impact on this issue as mayor. Thank you, Ryan. Mike? Thank you very much. Uh, you're right, uh, Sheboygan is becoming a very diverse community right now. We're a majority minority community in our school district and as those uh, students grow up, that's going to again accentuate itself in the rest of the population. Um, I have made several appointments trying to bring some of these diverse people in our community that have expressed interest in participation in some of our city committees. So, you know, there's people like Marcos and Jerry and Sammy and Jose who, who are serving on, on different committees that I've appointed in the past. But I'm always looking for new people. And one of the things that, um, that I'm going to be doing in the next term is uh, giving people a page on our website where they can apply and ask to be uh, put on a certain committee. And, and so we have more of a list of people that we can go to. Uh, you know, I, I've pointed some of the people that I've met uh, during my travels as mayor and and uh, and look for those people that uh, that would fit a certain role on a certain committee so we've done a, a fair amount in that but I think there's there's more room for uh, additional appointments in those areas um, I agree that uh, diversity is something where we want to make sure that everyone in this city feels that they're treated with dignity and respect thank you very much thank you Mike uh, the next question has to do with the the increase in public protests and demonstrations in Sheboygan and across the country, particularly in the last year. What's your view of this form of civic involvement? Well, I think uh, most of the protests that we saw were because of the George Floyd incident and really highlighted some of the problems that we have with race relations in our, our nation. Uh, some of those uh, marches took place here. We had, I think, four different people locally that were organizing those marches. And uh, our, our police department uh, responded to that by contacting them, building a relationship with them so that when there was a march, they'd let them know. There were police department people that were in the crowd and they didn't have any riot gear on. They were just wearing their normal, uh, you know, outfits that they have in their uniforms. And... Um, and they, uh, you know, participated with uh, the other people. And, and that really made a difference, I think, to those organizers to know that the city was behind them. And uh, the first march that we had, the following, that was on a Friday, and the following Tuesday, I met with a gentleman who, who planned that first march and began a dialogue with them and, and expressed that we wanted to see them have a chance to express themselves, but we wanted to make sure that it was done safely and there wasn't any violence or damage. And they really worked uh, with us to accomplish that. We had a second uh, shooting here in the city of Sheboygan uh, that, that took place and a black man died. And uh, there was a group from Green Bay that came in as marched as well as some of our other local uh, people that were concerned and, and they wanted to express you know, their uh, dismay at this event. And, uh, and we worked with that group to, to handle things. And again, we, we were successful in not having any, uh, any damage done or uh, any violence at all associated with it. So I really commend our police department for the great job they've done to control these issues. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, your response? Yeah, I, th I think um, uh, protesting and, and uh, having these activities, you know, when they're done peacefully, I think this is exactly what the vision of our founding fathers of what they had in expressing different points of view um, in, in raising different issues that, that are impacting different communities across Sheboygan. Um, I think it's, it's, it's vitally important to really make sure that, that the city, no matter what level, um, we're engaging with folks, listening to what they're having to say, and ensuring that their voices are heard fundamentally and ensuring that we can keep them safe moving forward um, and continue those dialogues and addressing those issues and making sure that we're making some real positive uh, changes in this community. Thank you. Uh, this next question will start with Ryan. Uh, cybersecurity is becoming more important every year with the increase in online activities and the importance of that online activity. One major vulnerability is the rise in ransomware attacks that lock up computer networks until a payment is made to the hackers. 
In particular, cities, schools, and hospitals are targeted with increasing frequency. What will you do to protect Sheboygan from such attacks? Yeah, this, this is surprisingly, this is an increasing issue for a lot of municipalities around the state. Um, vitally important, I think it's, it's that we need to fundamentally ensure that we're supporting our IT department, giving them the tools that they need to be successful in protecting cities' information, whether it's with HR or finance or public works um, or managing our fleet system. Um, a, lot of, a lot of what we do on the city right now is online, on the internet, um, and it's, it's a great way for folks to plug in and get connected with their city and kind of knowing what's going on. So um, making sure that we're listening with our IT department, making sure that we're providing them with the cutting edge support that they need and the tools that they need to be successful to protect our city um, with any sort of cyber, cyber security related issue. Thank you. Mike, your response? Thank you. Um, you know, this is a, a growing problem and, uh, you know, just when you think you've uh, solved it uh, for one community and, and you've gotten by, they, they dream up a new way to, to attack you. And um, the city of Sheboygan has been proactive in setting up redundant servers, so we have a backup a system that we have, and, and we've been really careful about all the emails that are coming into the city and, uh, and putting um, those in a, a sandbox, having uh, the software analyze them so that we're sure that there aren't any uh, bad things in the code of, of those emails. Uh, but there are uh, phishing schemes where, you know, if, if somebody uh, clicks on something wrong and, uh, and and doesn't use good judgment sometimes, you, you can make a mistake. So we've been trying to uh, put together some programs where we'll send something out that you know, mimics what uh, what some of these things do and, and try to catch people making a mistake so that we can work with them to correct that behavior so it doesn't happen if there's a real uh, phishing uh, scheme that comes to one of our computers through email. Uh, but with those redundant systems, I think we're in a good position, but we have to continue to, uh, to, to, to work to see that we, we're on top of all the new things that are coming out. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Mike, this next question will start with you. Roads and other methods of travel are key to any city, but this is a complex problem. We'd like to hear your thoughts on road maintenance and improvements, and in the spirit of inclusion, feel free to include your thoughts on alternatives such as bike paths, public transit, sidewalks, other pedestrian paths, any other solution, including the private automobile and other things. Well, this has been a, you know, as I've listened to our, our, our taxpayers, this is one of their big concerns, our city streets. And especially this time of the year when the freeze-thaw cycle shows a lot of potholes. But this was a concern that I've dealt with uh, over the years. And in the uh, six years prior to me becoming mayor, we were only resurfacing 1.4 miles of streets. And I've really made this an effort that we have to, that we did respond. And during the last seven years, we've been able to hit 4.2 miles of streets repaved on an average every year. So that's a three-fold increase in the number of streets that are being addressed. And we're not just doing our major thoroughfares, we're doing a lot of our neighborhood streets as well. So we're not ignoring those, but we are, are still having a priority on those major volume thoroughfares. We've, uh, we've also made a move to uh, purchase a paving machine so that uh, we can repair many of the streets with our own crew. That, that allows them to uh, mill off asphalt that's failing on a street and have our crew come in and put a new surface on. And we also are able to buy the asphalt from Sheboygan County and pay a much uh, uh, cheaper price because they don't have any profit involved and uh, we're using our own labor. So that allows us to extend those dollars much further. And the other thing that that we're, we're, we're working with is our public transit. One of the big accomplishments that we had two years ago was cutting a deal with the Sheboygan Area School District so that every student with their student ID can get on a city bus and ride it for free. So they can use this to get to school, they can get to uh, things that they have to do after school, to the library, and we're training a whole new generation of people in the city of Sheboygan. Those students are gonna, I think, use public transportation much more than many of us do today. So that's gonna really help us as time goes on and get maximum advantage of our transit system, which is, is a very good system. Thank, Thank you. you. Ryan? 
definitely roads is, is the hot hot topic out there today and this has been a huge issue um, for many years for the city that we've yet to fully tackle and address um, fundamentally we all understand that our roads are in pretty poor condition um, I, I believe a report came out a couple weeks ago giving Wisconsin's infrastructure a D rating um, and I'm sure uh, Sheboygan plays a key role um, in, in in that low grade as well. Um, we have over 200 miles of roads in the city, and it's it's a huge task in terms of how we're gonna look at how we're gonna um, fix these roads. Right now, I, I do think that we need to relook at what our roads plan is. I don't think folks wanna wait 14 years to ensure that their roads are done. We need to make sure that we're having a strategic plan that's incorporated with that, looking at the timing for that, looking at the fun funding mechanisms, and looking at what other options are out there so with that we can diversify our funding for roads as well. Um, we need to ensure that our public works department is supported and that they have that backup as well to get the job done and do it right, making sure that we have the proper tools in place so that when we're doing a project, we're doing it right. It's a high quality project and, and the work is getting done in a timely manner and we're respecting taxpayer dollars as well. But we also need to look at the impact that the loss of shared revenue has from the state in terms of how this has impacted the transportation funding from the local municip municipal level. So I'll make sure I'm a strong mayor that's communicating with our legislators, whether it's in Madison or Washington, D.C., making sure that we're getting our fair shake, shake and shared revenue so that we can increase more roads, so that we can ensure infrastructure is sound, so that our roads are repaired, so that, um, that we can help support our businesses and our local economy and tourism, um, because we all utilize the roads, and we all want to make sure our infrastructure is rock solid. Thank you. The next question also has to do with the way things are changing. It's not business and, and commerce aren't done the same way they've always been done. So in the news a lot around the country, various cities such as Sheboygan, short-term lodging rentals are coming under fire. Uh, they're getting increased scrutiny because they compete with existing hotels and they also compete with the permanent residents looking for affordable housing for long-term rentals. What controls, if any, should the city exercise over this type of business? Ryan, well, yes. Yeah, so I think the popular one um, we're referring to is like <coughs> Airbnbs. Um, and, and Airbnb is a growing global company that has provided new tools and new resources that help uh, municipalities like Sheboygan, as well as neighbors that have concerns with these issues. So I think there's some space there that uh, this, this, the city of Sheboygan can kind of step up and have some good partnerships in creating in, in terms of how we're communicating with, with those neighbors that are experiencing these issues. We need to understand that, that these are tools that do help um, with our tourism as well. I mean, we have some pretty big events coming down the line here for Sheboygan with the Ryder Cup, um, <clears throat> as well as key events at Road America. So we need to make sure that when, when we have these short-term lodging um, <coughs> access and, and points in the city that, that we have that strong communication with the residents and with the city government, ensuring that, um, that these are used properly and that they're not causing any disturbances in the neighbors. I, I represent part of uh, the southern shore of Lake, of Lake Michigan, um, and, and I've been working with a lot of neighbors on these issues as well. So I, I hear their concerns, and we're making sure that we're taking those smart approaches so that when those come to visit and utilize these short-term rent rentals that they're experiencing Sheboygan and, um, and having fun here, but also respecting the local neighborhood and community as well. Thank you. Mike? Thank you. Um, the, uh, there's been a couple of, of issues with these short-term rentals. Uh, one of them is uh, to have them pay room tax. And uh, we appreciate the move that uh, our federal government took to require all these Airbnbs and VBRO companies to, to make sure that those, uh, those payments are made. As far as the, the city of Sheboygan, um, you know, we, we're hosting the Ryder Cup coming up this year, it looks like, and there's gonna be a lot of places that are gonna be rented out. And, um, and we hope that none of these guests that are coming into our community are gonna uh, raise too much of a ruckus, uh, that they're gonna, eat and sleep and then go back uh, out to the golf course every day. Um, and uh, it'll bring a lot of revenue into our community. And it'll bring a lot of notoriety to our community. And it seems like every time there's a PGA event, the year after we get a real 
boom in our in our uh, tourism. So we're we're waiting for the the boom that'll come in 2022 uh, because of all this, and there'll be more and more people that'll that'll want to rent a, an Airbnb uh, and, and and come to Sheboygan. Now we do have some neighbors who have put up with uh, maybe some Airbnb operators that haven't made the best decision on their guests. And again, uh, the, the companies are trying to protect uh, the communities as well and trying to put more restrictions on the guests and the things that they can do. So we wanna work with them to try to accomplish that so that um, you know the people in Sheboygan can get the maximum value out of the, the real estate that they own, the city tourism benefits from that, and, um, and, and we have a much stronger community as a, as a, as a result of all that activity. Thank you very much. Now, I touched on it a little bit in the last question, but I'd like to expand more on the question of affordable housing and what kinds of things can be done to increase access? How do we make the determination where they should be located, how they're controlled, how they are uh, doled out among the people that need to access that? It's a key part of business growth is finding employees that can afford to live in the community and serve that community. So Mike, you can go first on this. Thank you very much. Uh, affordable housing is a real touch point for our community. But you know we've built about uh, just over 1,013 units right now in the last term. And 60% and of those units are affordable, uh, subsidized housing for our workforce in Sheboygan. And first of all, we want to have enough uh, room for all the people that are working in our di different uh, businesses and, and commerce so that they have a place to live in Sheboygan. Because if they have to live in Fond du Lac or Manitowoc, we're not getting the full value out of the employment that's in our community. We want them to live here and spend all their dollars here as well as work here. The other thing that, that uh, I think is a misnomer is we don't often get to decide where they're gonna build these things. It's the developers that are gonna decide. So we have projects and we work with developers every year we have a developer summit. We bring them in, we show off Sheboygan, we show some of the fun things you can do in the community and we take them around to all the development sites that we have. And they can pick and choose uh, the different ones that they see that they feel might be prime for their type of development. And then, you know, we have to work with them to get a development contract together and, and approve everything through the Planning Commission and our Architectural Review Board. And then finally, hopefully, we'll get to see a project built. But, um, but we really don't get to decide where many of these are going to go. We show people available sites, and they might find their own and, and say, well, I want to build it here. Can you approve this? And so we'll be working with these developers to, to try to, to do this because one of the ways that we keep taxes down is to build more tax base. And so that's going to be a prime activity for us to continue in this community. Thank you. Ryan? Definitely affordable housing is an issue that I've been hearing a lot about, and it impacts us in a lot of different ways, um, whether it's senior citizens ensuring that they can stay in their homes when they're on a fixed income, whether it's younger folks looking to plant their roots and grow in Sheboygan. Um, I mean, there, there's difficulty in, in, in a lot of different ways with housing, whether it's the increase of homelessness in our community, whether it's um, the lack of business development and growth because there's simply not enough housing in our housing stock to recruit and maintain that talent for our workforce in the general area. Right now, over 40% of our population pays more than 30% of their income on housing. By HUD standards, this does not meet the definition of affordable housing. So there's, this, there's a large group of our population in the city that struggles to pay um, for their housing costs. So we, we need to really relook at how we're serving our residents and supporting them when they're living in our community. Um, I served as the chairman of the Sheboygan County Housing Coalition a few years back, working with different nonprofit groups across the county, looking at how we can address some of our housing um, issues as well. So I, I'll work with um, developers to really kind of understand the key root and cause of why housing, first off, is more expensive to build in our community than it is in other parts of the state as well. I think there's a lot of different opportunities where we can help developers and, and provide a steady hand um, in, in direction, showing them what our needs are as a community, as well as how that benefits folks that are struggling to pay for their, their homes. And also we're, we're um, helping uh, attract new folks to help our businesses grow and expand. I don't believe we need to be building more luxury apartments. I think we need to diversify our housing stock by building duplex 
duplexes homes, single family homes, townhouses. Um, we've, other communities are doing this. Um, Janesville, Shorewood have, have gotten creative with how they use TIF financing to bring um, new affordable housing to their community. So I think that there's a lot of good examples out there of what we can look at in terms of how we can provide sound housing for our community. Thank you very much. Uh, Ryan, this next question I'll start with you. And it's somewhat related in that for affordable housing, one easy way to afford more housing is to get a more high paying job. Right now, there are many, many hundreds of jobs, if not thousands, in the city and the county that are requiring higher skills, either college education or technical training or some of the trades, and they're unable to fill those because there aren't enough applicants with the proper training. They've proven very difficult to fill. So how can we as a city attract either new workers to the area with these skills and training and or fill the pipeline and train local people for these jobs for the future? Yeah, and this, this is definitely a huge issue I've been hearing from local uh, business leaders as well in our community. Sheboygan County, for the last several years, we've had over 3,000, 4,000 jobs available in the community, and we can never seem to make a dent at that for some reason. So in my opinion, what we're doing right now is simply not working in terms of how we're um, filling this, the, the workforce need in our community. And it kind of becomes a chicken before the egg sort of situation in terms of, of housing as well, and in terms of job training and development. But I think Sheboygan, we're, we're, we have a lot of great organizations, a lot of great companies that fundamentally care about the people that we serve. I think if you look at the Red Raider uh, program that the Sheboygan Area School District has, I think foundationally that's an awesome program that we have to, um, to get our kids um, adjusted and, and, and exposed to, to some new skills out there so that we can provide those resources to fill those, those job gaps as well. So Sheboygan's lucky. We're very blessed to have some awesome partnerships. I think we've got to lean in in terms of the partnerships we're creating with the Sheboygan Area School District, making sure that we're exposing kids at a young age about all the job training opportunities that are out there. We have partners, we, have, we can um, work more closely with Lakeland University as well as LPC and UW-Green Bay, the Sheboygan <laughs> campus, um, and making sure that we can fill the needs and provide these job training programs that are specific to our community to ensure that the businesses that we have can grow <coughs> and thrive and making sure that new businesses that want to come and um, plant their roots here in Sheboygan County have access to those tools as well. And I think some simple partnership and simple planning like that, I think that will go a long way <coughs> Again, other communities have done this. I think we can uh, lead by example in terms of how we're providing this innovative approach and how we're helping um, fill these, these gaps um, in the job market right now. Thank you. Mike? Thank you very much. The uh, Sheboygan Area School District has done a great job of working with our business community with the Red Raider Manufacturing Program to put programs in place that people in our um, our community need to pick skills up that companies uh, are, are requiring. And, and the companies are providing the machines, they're providing the programming, and so uh, they also are, are doing internships with the, with the students so that uh, they can all uh, get those skills and become acclimated to their workforce very easily. And then uh, on the other hand, uh, we've seen uh, Lakeland University and LTC working with uh, a lot of the communities and uh, businesses to again put similar programs together and, and work with them to train uh, the, the staff that they need. As far as getting more people to the community, I think what we need to do is, is reach back uh, and try to find people that grew up in the area, people that left because they wanted to see the world. And now that they're married, maybe they have kids, uh, they might want to come back home to Sheboygan because we're one of the best places in the nation to raise a family. Maybe their parents are older now and, and they can't get along by themselves as well as they might, and, and they can come home uh, to help them out in their later years. So that's one of the big things that I think we should try to, to capitalize on. You know, working with um, some of the families, maybe when they're home during the holidays, be the perfect time for a job fair. Or working with uh, reunion groups that are having reunions for uh, the high school classes in the county to try to bring people back to Sheboygan. I know Acuity has done a lot of work with, uh, with that to try to bring uh, people back to Wisconsin, and they've been real successful in, in getting uh, the kids to come back right out of, uh, out of college. So again, yeah, 
we, we need more workers. Um, it, it's a problem that's going to continue. And I think some of these new methods will help us to achieve that goal. Thank you very much. I'd like to take a brief second here to give a shout out to a local resource that helps with the training. The AAUW, I know, has programs with young girls, young women, ladies, to get them excited about higher education and technical training. There are events periodically throughout the year. So check out AAUW and see if they have something that you are interested in. All right, next up, talking about business more in general. This, I'll start with Mike. Many businesses in the city are struggling for the pandemic and for other reasons, just the economy is changing so rapidly. How can the city help them survive and thrive while also attracting new businesses? Well, I appreciate that question. And uh, these businesses are very important to our city. Our, our residents depend on them for a lot of important services. So during COVID, we've uh, worked with them to allow some of our, uh, our hospitality industries to operate more outdoors. We've reduced some fees on the permits that were needed and we've streamlined that, that fee process so that uh, they can have more outdoor events. And then we, we put together uh, these assistance programs. We put $420,000 that we got from COVID-1, uh, the CARES Act, and, and put that money in place so that these businesses could apply for loans uh, up from $2,000 up to $15,000 to help these small businesses out. You know, in the past, we've had uh, pop-up shops to, to develop new businesses, and we've got a lot of empty spaces now, and I think we should go back to having more pop-up shops to, uh, to, to, to bring a new um, growth in, in businesses in our community. So that's, uh, you know, what I really think we need to do. Uh, you know, we have other programs for job development, like Redevelopment Authority has revolving loans that, that are available, and we've made many, many different uh, um, loans to different businesses, and we'll take a third or second, uh, second or third position so that the bank has uh, a little bit more assurance that this business is going to be successful. And, uh, you know, some of the great uh, businesses that we have like, right now, like Three Sheeps, uh, they were helped with this business program, and uh, it's great to see them flourish. Um, uh, there's, it's just been a, a great program. There's probably about $800,000 in that program to loan out for job development right now. So we want to put all of that money to use and uh, hope that those businesses will come and approach us, and we'll do what we can to assist them. Thank you. Ryan? I think fundamentally it needs to start with listening um, and engaging with our local businesses. On the, on the onset of this pandemic, um, on the council, a few of us, myself included, we met with different local business owners, partnered with the chamber, heard what their concerns are, hearing what barriers the city had for them to be successful. So we introduced legislation to cut red tape and ensuring that those businesses could get creative in doing outdoor seating um, and, and closing down 8th Street so that they could um, provide their services and keeping their customers safe and their staff safe as well. So I think the, the, the listening part is fundamental in ensuring and in, in identifying the problems that we're hearing and ensuring that we can be an advocate for the businesses. Um, and we have a lot of great resources and partnerships throughout the county, whether it's the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation, the Chamber of Commerce, or the BID. We have so many awesome opportunities here to advocate for businesses, and the city needs to be better plugged into them as well. Um, when, when we were provided aid at the start of the pandemic, uh, quite frankly, in my opinion, the city was sitting on that aid for far too long. When we're getting aid to local businesses, we need to ensure that we're reaching out to them directly and doing those mailers right away so that we're connecting and getting that money to those that need it. Um, we, we also have a lot of great assets in the city. Right now, we have the South Point Enterprise Campus that is clamoring to be filled with business development and expansion right here. We have sh shovel-ready land, and we need to promote that. We need to promote the, the resources and resilient people that we are in Sheboygan. We have a strong, great work ethic as well. And I know if we promote that um, and, and use, use those, those soft tools that we have in our toolbox, I know that we can be successful in the long term for small businesses as well and for businesses that want to grow and develop in our community. Thank you very much. I'd like to turn away from money and infrastructure, things like that, and Let's talk about something a little bit more natural. We live with a unique world-class natural resource on our doorstep, the magnificent Lake Michigan. Uh, 
I'm sure you're all familiar with it. It is a natural wonder, but it is always changing, and it requires us to be adaptable. Pollution, shoreline erosion, public access. How do you see the city's role in protecting the lake, using it to improve our quality of life, and leveraging its unique appeal? Ryan? Yeah, I, I think number one, the thing that we hear every single year from businesses, community members, residents, is that Lake Michigan is our number one asset. We're so blessed to live on such a truly great lake. Um, and, and Lake Michigan provides so many awesome opportunities for us, whether it's tourism, whether it's recreation, um, whether it's jobs and industry as well. So we need to do as much as we can to protect and ensure that Lake Michigan um, is respected and we're, we're making sure that um, our lakeshore is protected as well. I've been endorsed by Clean Wisconsin Action Fund as well because conservation groups know that I'm going to be the strongest advocate when it comes to protecting the lake and ensuring that um, our natural resources are preserved so that future generations can enjoy them. Um, Sheboygan is, is so unique as well because um, we have the most access to the beach uh, per capita in the state of Wisconsin compared to any other <coughs> municipality. So whether you're going on the beach um, to enjoy a sunny day, whether you're going to the dog walk on the south side, whether you're, you're taking your boat out to go fishing, um, there, there's a lot of awesome opportunities and we need to ensure that we're working with those partners that benefit and utilize the lake, <coughs> hearing what they're having to say so that we can maximize the experience and we can do what we can to protect the lake for future generations as well. Thank you. Mike? Thank you very much. Uh, lake Michigan is our greatest asset. When we promote our tourism, we cite ourselves as the Malibu of the Midwest and that f with the best freshwater surfing on Lake Michigan. And that's been a unique hook that has really helped to promote our tourism and bring more people to our community. Recreation is a key part of all tourism today. And uh, not only the surfing, but uh, the windsurfers, the kayakers, the people that are sport fishing, um, that really plays into uh, why people come to a community. So it's, it's a big uh, ticket for us to bring people here. Um, you're right, the, the lake levels are, uh, are causing some issues. Uh, the city's going to have to uh, reinforce the uh, south side sewer interceptor. That's going to be a, uh, at least an $8 million project. We're going to reline that as well as reinforce it. And uh, we've got to make those investments to ensure that that utility is there for our community in the future. The other thing that, uh, that I've been working on, I'm chairman of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, a group of over, just over 100 mayors in, uh, around the Great Lakes in both the U.S. and Canada. And we've been trying to work to keep the Asian carp out of the, the Great Lakes system. Right now, the Brandon Road Dam on the Chicago River is very close to Lake Michigan. And uh, you've all seen those pictures of the uh, Asian carp jumping out of the water when a, when a boat goes through. And that would just devastate our recreation that we have on the Sheboygan River. And they would also decimate the, uh, the sport fishing that we have over time on Lake Michigan. So that's a, a big thing that we've been fighting for. And we just got uh, an okay from the Corps of Engineers on that. The other thing that I've been doing is, uh, is going to Great Lakes Day and, uh, and, and also uh, lobbying our, our congressional representatives for funds to assist us in these programs. So we've been able to keep the Great Lakes Restoration Fund in place. That had a big impact on Sheboygan uh, when we cleaned up the Sheboygan River. And, uh, and we just have to be very careful of this resource so that it continue to serve our community for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is also dealing with the lake. Uh, the National Marine Sanctuary System has identified Sheboygan as a part of the so-called Shipwreck Coast. Do you see an opportunity for the city to make that part of the identity? Mike? Yes, I do. You know, uh, again, I've been working on this for the last eight years with the cities of Port Washington, Manitowoc, and Two Rivers. And uh, we were able to get Governor Walker to submit an application for us. Unfortunately, he had second thoughts about it, and he pulled it back. But we worked with Governor Evers. He's now resubmitted our application. And right now, the Congress just approved a new secretary of the Commerce Department, and the Commerce Department will be in charge of, of pushing this forward. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we're maybe about six months away from designation as a National Marine Sanctuary. Now, each community 
they'll have different things that they'll promote uh, as far as their association with it. You know, we really have a great facility in Manitowoc to, to handle the shipwrecks and the Maritime Museum. But what Sheboygan is trying to do is tackle the science and technology. And again, we look at this as, as building um, uh, good things in our students so that they get a good STEAM education here in our community. And the things that we're going to put in, uh, a new exhibit that we want to put into our uh, Visit Sheboygan office down on A Street is the Science in the Sky exhibit. And this will have a lot of different uh, things like solar panels, aquaponics, uh, rain gardens, things that uh, we want to teach our, our children about and understand. And it'll also uh, f focus on technology. Right now in place, we have the Science in the Sky exhibit, which is a globe with four projectors, and that allows you to show all kinds of different educational things on that globe. You can show all kinds of different things as if that was the Earth. You could show a seismic activity, the resulting shock waves, and the tsunami that that could produce, as well as make that, uh, that show um, like any planet that, that, that's out there or any star. So uh, I'm really happy that it's progressed this far. This will give us another reason for sh people to come to Sheboygan, and, and we'll be on a really short list with 14 other National Marine Sanctuaries around the United States. Thank you. Ryan? Yeah, I, I'm on the same page with Mike and agree that the Marine Sanctuary will be a, an asset to our community. Um, a lot of folks don't know that there's a lot of different shipwrecks um, placed just right off of, of our shore here. And this is an awesome way to promote our community with, um, with divers and different explorers as well um, and truly, uh, do, pun intended, dive right in um, and enjoy a lot of the, the sunken ship um, and, and Great Lake history that we have right off our, our shore. Um, so I'm, I'm supportive and hoping that, that this plan gets moved forward as well. But there have been issues with this raised along the way in terms of, uh, of, of just um, local control. And I want to ensure that we're hearing those concerns and making sure that we're addressing those as well. Um, addressing those homeowners that live on the lake, and making sure that their voices are heard so that we can make sure that we are truly successful um, when, when, we, when we implement this plan moving forward. Thank you very much. Uh, next, there are currently more than 300 <coughs> municipal broadband networks in the U.S. <coughs> and it's claimed that these networks can provide affordable high-speed access to more people and stimulate <coughs> economic development by attracting new businesses. Do you support a Sheboygan Municipal Broadband Network? Ryan, yes. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I think that this, this is an, an interesting topic that's been discussed um, through the League of Municipalities and other communities across Wisconsin as well. Overall, I would say I am supportive. I would want to look at costs in terms of how it's implemented as well. Um, but I think 2020, or the past year in the COVID pandemic, has truly illustrated um, the, the importance of, of high-speed internet whether it's kids that are learning remotely from school or whether it's businesses that are um, increasing their, their virtual offerings with their businesses and getting creative. So I think if this is a tool that helps businesses succeed, helps the community, community succeeds, and offers a resource for students to learn, I'm all for it, but let's make sure that we're doing it right and that it fits in with our community um, and that we can have a true benefit from it. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Um, the broadband issue in Sheboygan is something that our municipalities have dealt with together, at least for our own use. Uh, we put a ring of fiber around the city of Sheboygan, and that serves the Sheboygan Area School District, Sheboygan County, and the city of Sheboygan, and we shared the cost of this ring to give us the access that we need to the internet for all of our operations. It's unfortunate, but the state of Wisconsin prevents the city of Sheboygan from offering a municipal broadband network. So in order to do any of the other things uh, to help our businesses out or maybe residential properties, we're going to need to have uh, laws changed in the state of Wisconsin's capital in order to allow that to happen. But I think that um, the moves that we've made uh, gives the city all the broadband that we need. It supports all of our networks. And it uh, makes it easy for the Sheboygan Area School District to provide all the services that they need to their students, as well as Sheboygan County. There's a chance that Sheboygan County might extend this out into the, the county further, but that would be at their cost. And uh, if they do, I hope that they give other municipalities a chance to participate like we've done here uh, with the city and the Sheboygan Area School District. Thank you. Uh, 
the final question I have, uh, we, we've got enough time, so I'm going to ask one more question and then give you each an opportunity to give a closing statement for a couple of minutes. But this final question uh, might be a simple one that we could knock off quickly. Uh, I'll start with Mike. Some cities offer an incentive to city employees if they live in the city. What are your views on this type of program? Well, you know, I'd like all of our, our city res I mean, our, our employees to be city residents, but right now we're like many businesses and we're trying hard to find uh, some of the special employees that we need. And so while that was, would be a desire, it's a little bit more of a, a need when it comes to some of our safety personnel, but, but while that's a desire, it's something that I think we have to put on the back burner right now because we can't not hire a great employee that we, we've seen just because they don't live in the city or they don't want to move into the city. We've got to take every chance to bring the best into our operation and, and, and make them part of our employee base to provide good services for our community. So it's not as important to me as, as maybe it was to some of the legislators in the past. It's a desire, but, but not something that's a, a must have uh, for me as, as far as our hires. Thank you, Ryan. I, I think having city employees live in the city is a wonderful thing that all cities wanna strive and achieve. However, there's, there's a multitude of other issues that play and come into to effect when you're, when you're talking about that. And again, in my opinion, I think there's housing components that that make it more difficult when, when housing is not available for folks to relocate and move their family here as well. So those are different challenges as well that need to be addressed. But I agree with Mike and what he said in terms too that um, we wanna make sure that we're hiring the best talent that we can so our city can be successful and how we're delivering services throughout the community. Um, but I don't necessarily know if, if it's the right um, moment for us to, to make that approach. Thank you very much. Now, we've spent almost an hour listening to me ask my questions and steer the conversation in a certain direction. So what I would like to do is give you both an opportunity to share with us the things that you find most important, the skills that you bring to this position. Uh, give, us, give us a closing statement. I'll start with Ryan, and we'll have two minutes, and then immediately after this event, there's going to be the next forum. And I also would like to take this opportunity to remind everybody, if you have not registered to vote, it is not too late. Election day is the 6th of April. Call the city clerk. They'll be happy to give you all of the information and how to do that. Uh, thank you. Go ahead, Ryan. Two minutes. Well, well thanks again for the AUW for having this forum. Um, this was a great opportunity to share my ideas and reflections of, of what I've been hearing from folks and what I'm hoping to do in the future. I think right now, um, what's before you in, in, in terms of when we're moving forward to the April election, we need to ask the question to ourselves, what do you want Sheboygan to be in the next four years? Do you believe that another term of the same recycled ideas is going to get us there? Or do you believe, like I believe, that to reach our fullest potential to grow our incredible community, that we need to take a new fresh direction in how we're helping uh, serve our local government? When you're voting in the voting booth on April 6th, I'm asking you not to choose who's going to lead Sheboygan, but what future do you want for our community? I'm running for mayor of my hometown because I know with hard work, creative problem solving, and fresh leadership in City Hall, we can build a middle class, that make, ensuring that they're growing, that everyone has a sense of belonging, that we all have access to affordable housing, our roads are repaired, and where we all can thrive. I'd be honored to have your vote on April 6th. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mike, final word to you this evening. Well, again, thanks to AUW for putting this event together. Mm -hmm. And I would really like to emphasize the experience and leadership that I've gained during my 48 years in Sheboygan. Uh, I came to Sheboygan and became involved in community organizations and assumed leadership roles in the JCs, Sheboygan Rotary, the YMCA, and Big Brothers and Big Sisters. I've also had business experience. I managed Dubois Formal Wear for 40 years, served as the president of the Downtown Sheboygan Association, the Harbor Center bid, and on the Sheboygan Development Corporation. And then local government experience, I served as a citizen on the City Planning Commission, the Capital Improvement Commission, and chair of the Park Board. And then as an elected representative, I served as a city alder person, a county supervisor, county board chairman, mayor, and on the Sheboygan Development Corporation Board. 
And I also have regional experience as the board chair of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, a bi-national organization of 100 mayors in the U.S. and Canada that's, that's really driving uh, the protection of our Great Lakes. While serving in all these roles, I've learned the importance of listening to our residents. Because I listened, I was able to implement changes that our residents were looking for, uh, like a street resurfacing program that's really achieved re real results in tripling the amount of streets resurfaced, uh, forming the Mayor's Neighborhood Leadership Council and supporting our growth of our neighborhood associations from 2 to 12, uh, partnering with the police department to reduce Part 1 crimes to, by 31%, and improving the communication on our community with things like our, our city newsletter and next door. So uh, tonight I had a good dis we had a good discussion of the issues facing the city of Sheboygan and I've outlined my 48 years of experience in the community and outstanding achievements during the last eight years. And it's a real experience that you can trust to lead Sheboygan forward to face the challenges that we have in the future. I appreciate the opportunity to serve in the role as mayor and I respectfully ask for your vote to serve another four terms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time and thank you everybody for watching. We appreciate it. Don't forget to vote April 6th. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Ryan and Mike, for participating in tonight's event. <clears throat> Moving right on to the forum for the second district aldermanic contest, we have two candidates, Roberta Filicki Paneski and John Ranieri. The moderator will be Margaret Hall. The timekeeper will be Eleanor Young. They are both um, members of AAUW. Thank you. Good evening, Roberta and John. I'd like to ask you some questions and would appreciate your responses on them. So Bert, let's start with you, Roberta, excuse me. Um, why are you running for council and what is the one best contribution that you will bring to council? Be here, I appreciate that. Um, likely one of my better uh, contributions I think will be the fact that I have served on the City Redevelopment Authority for a number of years. I have been appointed by five different mayors uh, development is one of my passions. So I have a depth of knowledge and a real excitement about the growth of um, the growth of our community and the growth of our tax base and doing it in a planned, organized, sensible fashion. Um, I also have a background as a financial advisor. So I do like the money part. Um, when um, I was appointed to the council. Actually, I was elected to the council last July to fill a vacancy. Uh, I was appointed to the Finance and Personnel Committee. So um, I've served for um, 10 months and uh, would like to continue to do that. Thank you. And John, why are you running for council and what is the one best contribution that you will bring to the council? I'm running for city council to help further our community. Um, my uh, contribution that I bring is the business that I am currently in. I see residents daily and hear from them every day. So I, I know some of the things that the city is looking for, the residents and uh, things that can help out with the city. Thank you. And then John will start the next question with you. What are the three most important challenges facing the city council? Well, I think some of the things uh, discussed in the uh, mayoral forum are the challenges that the uh, city council faces. Uh, 
the issue with the roads and how to get those done and get them done in a timely fashion. Um, just in our district too, there's a, a lot of uh, bad roads and some of the roads aren't just side roads. There's main thoroughfares like Geely Avenue and 6th Street that are in bad disrepair. Um, you know, the uh, lake erosion is one thing that uh, a lot of citizens living right on the lake are is a big concern for um, and how to how to handle that problem and affordable housing again the uh, having affordable housing to attract people to our community and uh, fill job vacancies it's not not easy to hire somebody in the city of Sheboygan right now thank you Roberta, what do you think are the three most challenging um, items facing the city council? Um, one, balancing the budget. Uh, this year, the budget was tight. Next year, it is likely to be tighter because the revenues that we have collected in 2020 and beginning in 2021 um, are down significantly. So balancing the budget uh, I also think that diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think we're seeing the beginning of, of a movement that is not going to go away. This community is 73% white. That means that 25% plus of our community um, may or may not be included in what we do. So um, that would be my second. And uh, the third is uh, protection and or and plus development of our most precious resource, which is right out most people's front door, and that's our Lake Michigan. We've got to really understand that we are who we are because we live on that lake, and it is extremely significant for our community. Thank you. Roberta, we'll start with you on this one. <laughs> what are the greatest assets of the city of Sheboygan and how would you build upon them? Oh, well, I, <laughs> I just mentioned one in the previous question and I think the most significant asset is our uh, magnificent lakefront. As a member of the Redevelopment Authority mm -hmm. over the years, we have significantly said the Redevelopment Authority owns property. For example, the Redevelopment Authority owns South Pier. We own the land, the land. Other people come and develop it. We own the land on the waterfront. And I am a big proponent of the city should continue to own the land along the waterfront because the waterfront is everybody's, everybody's land and other people can come in and develop it and do what they want within guidelines. But I think that's our biggest asset. Our second asset um, is our population. We are hardworking. We are generous to a fault sometimes. Uh, we are involved and we like it here. Most people really like it here. So those are precious things. We are a human scale community. You can walk anywhere in this community. You can drive from one end to the other in 15 minutes. And there are not very many communities left that are as human scale and as wonderful. Thank you. And John, what are the greatest assets of Sheboygan and how would you build upon them? Well, I would have to agree with Roberta on the lake as one of the greatest uh, assets that Sheboygan has. Uh, it brings in tourism. Uh, it brings people to live here because it's so close. Uh, it's within walking distance for most people, if not just a short five minute drive um, there's so many recreational opportunities with fishing. Uh, my family enjoys uh, having a fire around the uh, fire rings down there. 
um, to see more more things like that, more more opportunities for families and children and adults to uh, use the lake would be a, a great great thing to drive more people into our community. Um, I mean, uh, the second greatest asset, uh, well, just uh, our community as a uh, place to uh, live. It's one of the, uh, I believe, the top 10 cities to retire in or bring a family to live in in the country. And uh, to be able to bring more people into the community to live and work is, uh, is a great thing. Thank you. Our next question, and we'll start with John. What do you envision as the most appropriate development for the armory site? Well, there's many things that could happen at the armory site. Um, I believe actually uh, one of the things that were looked at and uh, trying to save the armory was to make it into a, a recreational spot, a place with a, a park and uh, things for families and the community to use. And I think that would be a great asset to the community to turn that into a, a recreational area, possibly uh, put an ice skating rink or something in there for the community in the winter time. Uh, I think that would be a great use for it. Thank you. Roberta. Um, the armory site, which is now not an armory, but a sometimes gravel hill kind of grassy space. Um, interesting to watch it come down. I was on the committee that reviewed the initial project plans for that site for the developers, there were several good ideas. Uh, everything from save the armory and make it a, a recreational space, interior uh, music venue, to um, the one that was eventually, as part of this committee, uh, the winner, which was a small boutique hotel. And we ended up doing none of those, and the projects will, will have to go out for bid again. The simple answer is we need to put something there that respects the space and respects the consistency of that neighborhood. Um, when the building for um, the hotel was there, they were very careful to say it will be a short building. It, it's not going to be seven stories. It's going to be one story and two story and three story so that we don't dwarf the neighborhood that's there. So um, big answer is something that is consistent with the neighborhood that is there. And the next answer is developers come into the community because they look to put something there that will put a return on their investment, so we wait to see what they propose and what might be possible. But big thing for the community, and we need to have a lot of listening. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, then Roberta, we'll begin the next one with you. The city is increasingly diverse ethnically, religiously, in gender, and in many other ways. We see this reflected in our neighborhoods and schools and classrooms, yet it's not reflected in the government and civic leadership positions. How would you include and encourage citizens from these groups to serve on committees and participate in city government? Okay, um, I have said previously that our community is 73% white. The the workers in the city of Sheboygan are 98% white. So we need to start at home and we need to be very proactive. Uh, one of the things that the League of Municipalities has tracked over the years, P 
people tend, if, if people are here as workers, they tend to recommend their neighbors, friends, relatives for jobs because they know there are job openings coming up, which then perpetuates not reaching outside of the normal. So what we need to do is be more creative about where we look for people, how we look for people, um, and partner with those community organizations that, that regularly stay in touch with the underrepresented in the community. I know there are a lot of people willing and there are a lot of people able. I was pleased to hear that there perhaps would be a website where if you are willing and able, you can put your name in to work here, be a member of a committee. Uh, it does make a difference. Every study ever done says it makes a difference to have diversity when you're trying to reach a conclusion and the conclusions are hardier, more stable, and uh, more welcoming all around. Thank you. John, how would you include and encourage citizens from these groups to serve in committees and in city government? Well, I think some of that uh, can start at the school level, uh, grade school, high school, uh, encouraging uh, taking tours of the city hall, encouraging uh, younger people to uh, enter into uh, government things when they're uh, when they're in their younger ages. Um, it's not. It's kind of somewhat of a, a scary thing to to jump into, no matter uh, no matter who you are. Um, but to uh, you know encourage that and. Uh, you know, the city is having that website to try to encourage uh, encourage more people to apply for uh, things within the city. Uh, just a lot of uh, a lot of talking, encouraging other people to do things like that. Uh, people ask me, you know, about running, why I'm why I'm running, and people from all different uh, races and everything else. Um, and I, I personally encourage them to, to do it because you can't do anything if you're, if you're just sitting in the sidelines. Thank you. And our next question, we'll start with John. The city's marina has always been a financial burden on taxpayers, contrary to the rosy predictions as when it was being built. It is still two to $3 million in debt. Many of the docks have never been leased Ice damage is a big cost in severe winters. What is the future of the marina as it continues to struggle? Well, that is a very good question. Um, I don't know much about the uh, marina as it currently is. Um, if the docks are not currently being leased, then it's something to take a look at is why they're not being leased. Um, it doesn't uh, doesn't require a fifty thousand dollar study to uh, to figure out reasons why. Um, as a business owner, I'm constantly looking at reasons why and reasons or ways to improve uh, what is going on. And the marina is the same thing. It's a business. It's losing money because it's not being properly utilized. Um, I know. Uh, I, went in with some friends and purchased a, a boat last year and um, the marina is very expensive to to be at um, so we found a, a much less expensive place to be at uh, so the cost of a dock slip could be a reason that people are discouraged from from putting their boats there uh, but looking at all the all the reasons and Maybe it's not being promoted properly to get people to utilize the marina uh, is another thing. What kind of advertising is being done? Um, you know, I, when I purchased the boat with friends, I had all the different uh, clubs in the, in the city were trying to get me to put their backs there, but uh, nobody, nobody encouraged me to put it at the marina. Thank you. Roberta? Um, I think there are probably a couple of 
a couple of primary reasons. One is lack of advertising, um, the ability to promote and the enthusiasm with which you promote is pretty important to continue with the marina. I know they have been struggling. Um, some of it is also people locally are not oftentimes aware of all of the possibilities in that marina. So I think, you know, come and see your tourism at home. Come and see and tour your own marina. The second is a little bit more complex, and it is by virtue of the fact that the marina is about, is not about, it is eight blocks away from all of the businesses and fun things you can do. And in some communities, the marina, example, Port Washington, the marina backs right up to their downtown. You get off the boat, you go to the restaurant, you go to the movies, you go, you walk everywhere. You go buy a little t-shirt uh, at a local store. We can't move 8th Street down to the marina, nor can we move the marina up to 8th Street. But we can be creative in, in, in making alleyways and pedestrian pathways with X number of feet between the ice cream shop and a place to stop and put your feet up on a chair in a, in a niche park. So we have to be a little bit more creative and enter into um, making that marina um, more hospitable, I could say. Make the marina more hospitable and uh, maybe it will cash flow better. Thank you. All right, Roberta, we'll start sure. with you this time. Milwaukee, West Bend, Racine, Kakana are offering incentives to city employees um, if they live in the city. Would you support this plan for Sheboygan? Well, interesting you should ask because <laughs> just recently I had a discussion with another older person about the very same thing. Um, I do think there are some some issues with that. One is, let's assume I'm a city worker and I am sitting next to somebody, also a city worker, doing exactly the same kind of city job that we both do. I'm earning more by virtue of where I live or my colleague is earning more by virtue of where they live. I have a little bit of a hard time with that. Um, it also would be difficult because of, of the pool of talent. When you look for a specialized talent, we are still a city of around 50,000 people. Specialty talent can't always come from a pool of 50,000 people. The other problem statement is you find a specialty talent they want to move into the city, and we run into housing. There's no place, there's a housing shortage. So I think it's probably, other communities have done it. I think it is probably worth looking at. I think we need to tread carefully by bifurcating, bifurcating pay by virtue of where you live. Thank you. John, would you like me to repeat it again? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'd say it uh, depends on what the incentive is. Um, like Roberto was saying, if it's, uh, you know, if it, the aldermanic position is not a, uh, it's not a paid position, so to speak, um, but other, you know, city clerk and people like that are, uh, police officers, uh, Etc. cetera, um, city of Milwaukee had a, uh, a mandatory residency up until a number of years ago and they eliminated that for the exact same reason we're talking about it right now is because it's hard to get necessarily the people that you need that are here in the community so you have to pull from other places. Um, 
a, a move-in incentive versus like a, a dollar amount you make uh, would be something that would make sense to ease the uh, transition into moving into the city uh, versus you know, making more money than somebody that lives in the city because then as far as fairness and everything like that, it, it doesn't uh, tread well with anybody really uh, except for the person that's making the more money for moving to the city. Uh, but a, a moving incentive, as long as it fits into the, the city budget, makes sense to me. Thank you. Our next question, and we'll start with, with John, is how can the city repurpose the big box buildings that have been empty for years, such as the pick and save building on Calumet and South Business Drive and the former Shopco store? Well, the city, as far as repurposing those, um, again, it's trying to, you know, trying to drive more businesses to come into the city. Uh, and that, again, has to do with uh, you know, the residency and gaining more residents here because a big box company that would take over something like that is going to look for a larger population to succeed in there, and that's why some of those stores are empty. Uh, if the city was going to repurpose them, we'd have to look and see what type of uh, developments, you know, developers that are looking to do things within our community to uh, to make things happen. Uh, Thank you, Roberta. What would you do or propose with the empty big bu big box stores? Um, first, I'd market the market the pieces out of them, starting there. Um, again, if it's a developer that would be interested in a big box store. Now, having said that, there are a few things that the city can do, and one of those is we've already done it. Um, our senior center is relocating to a former big box store on North 8th Street, former grocery store. And it was, it was kind of a set of matched needs. The senior center needed different space. They needed larger space. That space was empty. And it was also on a bus route. The senior center where it was previously was not on a bus route. It didn't have enough parking. This one has a lot of parking. But the overriding issue was that is a neighborhood that really needs a little boost. And I think that's where the city can move in and look at some creative ways to do that. Some of the, some of the spaces you mentioned are primarily commercial. So it's a matter of getting a developer interested and allowing, um, allowing them to determine what might work and what might not work in that space. Thank you. And Roberta, the next question will begin with you. <laughs> what ideas do you have for bringing more people and businesses to the downtown? One of the things that um, was done and started years ago, and I was involved with the Chamber of Commerce as well as the uh, Redevelopment Authority, we started the tours. And when we started, you know, come and see what Sheboygan has to offer, the first tour we did, and it was, it was kind of the beta test for inviting heavy-duty developers to town, we took our own um, realtors, uh, put them on the little trolley, took them around, fed them breakfast, fed them lunch, um, and talked about all of the resources that we had. Uh, I was the trolley rider for one afternoon, and we went out to um, Bookworm Gardens, and uh, the dean of the university came out to greet the group, and we looked at Bookworm Gardens. I was amazed when I heard in the crowd 
I never knew this was here. And I thought, okay, we need to keep doing these kinds of things. So um, looking at that, um, there, there, are, there are numbers of ways um, that we can do things. Thank you. John, what would you do to bring more people and businesses to the downtown? Well, I think uh, encouraging more of those pop-up shops that we were doing last year, uh, let, uh, letting uh, people put in businesses for a short period of time uh, helps encourage that. If something really uh, takes off, they can they can run with it, and um, there's quite a few empty spots in our downtown area. And um, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, has always run through my mind as I try to park downtown, and uh, we have uh, parking meters everywhere. And actually, this is just for businesses, but for tourism, which is going to help support the businesses. Uh, we have these outdated parking meters and sometimes I don't have 25 cents so then I'm driving and walking two three blocks to get to where I'm going because I can't park right in front of the right in front of the store um, so removing parking meters or updating our parking meters uh, where people can use credit cards or pay on their phone um, is something that a lot of cities are switching to in their downtown areas, uh, especially the more uh, cashless our society becomes um, is one thing. Uh, but uh, finding different ways to encourage businesses to come into the community uh, through different uh, developments. Um, I'm sure there's different grants out there offered from our state and federal government that we can uh, be encouraging people to uh, take advantage of. Thank you. All right. Then uh, some of the solutions to the restrictions required for safety during the pandemic have an uneven impact on the people in Sheboygan. Working and learning remotely is possible, but not necessarily available to all equally. What can be done to give everyone better access to available services? And we'll start with John. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, getting better access to services, uh, you know, relies uh, on internet. Um, so one of the questions during the mayoral forum was uh, the broadband uh, for the city. Um, that working with the state to encourage them to change their laws to uh, allow for a municipal broadband uh, would be one way to gain better access to those uh, who don't have access to, to go uh, to different places. Um, it's a it's a tough topic, really, uh, mm -hmm. because it's it's uncharted territory and still is uh, uncharted territory for uh, different accesses to to everything. Um, you know, there's for the elderly. There's always been different uh, community services or uh, you know, state uh, paid for uh, transportation and things like that. Uh, but for um, younger people who are at home, there really isn't a, isn't a lot for them. So it, it actually would require a lot of discussion and um, teamwork and brainstorming to make something like that uh, more accessible. One man doesn't have the answer for that. Thank you. Roberta? Can you repeat that question? I was just gonna say, well, let Thank me repeat you. that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the solutions to the restrictions required for safety during the pandemic have had an uneven impact on people in Sheboygan. Working and learning remotely is possible, but not necessarily available to all equally. What can be done to give everyone 
better access to available services. Okay, the, the, the question to me is, the, uh, there, there's a couple parts to it. Mm -hmm. um, the pandemic has treated frontline workers differently. It has treated people of color differently, oftentimes because those are the very people that are in our restaurants, making our food, washing the dishes, cleaning the houses, cleaning the commercial buildings. They don't have the opportunity that so-called white collar workers have had to stay home and do their work. They can't. Their work is where their work is. Factory workers on the line didn't have the option to stay home. They had to be online to do the work. I don't know that an intervention can help with those kinds of resources. Um, any kind of resources can help with that kind of intervention. Um, putting them further ahead in the COVID line for vaccinations would help, but that's one. Um, the school children are, are a different thing. Oftentimes it's not only the lack of an internet, but also the lack of the equipment that get you on the internet. Um, and that is something that the school system can address and needs to address. If the city can um, ring the city with broadband, there's a way to do that for the children. Thank you. How can we maintain safe neighborhoods? Roberta? In the great scheme of things, I do believe that our neighborhoods are relatively safe in the great scheme of things. I can go for a walk and feel relatively comfortable. Would I go out at midnight by myself? No. But we do have a safe city. And our statistics from our police department show us that there is, we are a safe city. Um, we can always be more vigilant. We can make it safer. Um, the effort at neighborhood policing has, I think, been significant. Uh, you can know your own police officer by name, and you can see your police officer at neighborhood meetings, neighborhood organizations. So I think doing what we are doing, doing more of the same, and something that we haven't brought up is the drug trafficking, the people trafficking, and um, efforts to curtail that, I think will also keep our communities safe. Thank you. John, how can we maintain safe neighborhoods? Well, the again, the city is, uh, I, it's a pretty safe uh, city to uh, live in, take a walk in. Um, I don't think many people have a have a major uh, major safety concerns in the city of Sheboygan. I think our police department uh, they do a lot uh, to maintain uh, uh, community relationships. Uh, I know they do a lot of like their frat fries and uh, I think it's, I can't remember what the name of it is like, uh, but they do their cookouts uh, in different areas of the community to uh, try to bring everybody uh, together as a community. Our uh, neighborhood associations, uh, I think, do a lot to uh, help maintain the neighborhoods and the, uh, the safety of the neighborhoods. Um, Neighborhood watch uh, areas, which you don't see uh, a, a lot of uh, in the city of Sheboygan, but that's uh, uh, one way to also help maintain that. And uh, you know, the uh, the drug trafficking, the human trafficking, is a is a big uh, is a big thing that kind of gets swept under the rug 
uh, as far as safety goes because it uh, it gets just swept under the rug, but it's uh, it, there's different ways to, to help combat that, and uh, it's something that our you know our pharmacy, big pharmacy has uh, kind of made happen in the last uh, 20 or 30 years in, uh, in our country in general. Um, so it's something that uh, is going to be a continually uh, battle to fight. Uh, Thank you. All right. Um, next question. How can Sheboygan uh, retain and service companies that want to expand? Tom? Well, um, that goes back to uh, uh, affordable housing in our community and uh, you know, being able to attract uh, people into the community. Um, just owning a small business with 10 employees, uh, if I have somebody that, uh, that leaves the city for a different job or uh, you know, I have uh, younger employees that are going to college, uh, it's it's hard just to, to hire one person uh, no matter no matter what the pay is even if it's a, a higher paying position um, so uh, to get business to expand um, is again going to be entails uh, a lot of different uh, aspects in the community um, but I think uh, you know, Sheboygan is moving in the right direction, is asking the right questions to, to get people into our community. Thank you. And Roberta? I am. How, how would you retain services and help companies that want to expand? Thank you. Um, I am reminded of something that the Chamber of Commerce did several years ago systematically they interviewed by industrial groups so interviewed all the printers in our community interviewed all the food manufacturers in our community and and by industry category and we developed a, a sense of what that particular industry needed uh, case in point is the old world creamery it used to be a um, uh, milk, uh, milk production was there. They had the equipment that the butter people needed to make butter at the Old World Creamery. Um, they came in and they approached the Redevelopment Authority. We gave them, I believe the first loan was a quarter of a million. And after that, um, they were up and running much to the amazement of other local businesses, they had more applicants than they needed to have. One of my observations was, of course, they're on a bus route. So they had employees that were very eager to work there. And within two years, I think, they came back to us and said, we like it here so much we would like to install a second line of specialty butter, and do you think that's feasible? They came back to the Redevelopment Authority. Um, we said, yes, we are very happy with you. We like you. Um, you've been creating jobs, creating more jobs than they were obligated to create, and it was a win-win-win for everybody. So. Um, We've got the mechanisms, and we can do it. Thank you. The city has not been very successful in attracting businesses to the new business park mm -hmm. on the south side. What would you do to bring new businesses to Sheboygan? Roberta, you're yeah, first. Sure. There is some activity going on behind the scenes. Um, there are a couple of nibbles. 
what is significant again is marketing and we recently developed a plan with something called New North, um, which is a regional area um, bordering the lake, northeastern Wisconsin, basically. And they have a market program specifically for what is called shovel ready, meaning we've got the roads, we've got the lights, we've got the streets, we've got it all. You come in with your shovel and on day one, in that property, you can build your factory. So there are, there are ways to do that. Regrettably, that particular park came to fruition at about the same time that COVID started going the opposite way. So um, we're up and running again. We're trying some new and innovative things, uh, again, to market to make people aware that it's there. And um, it, is a, it is a lovely space, shovel ready, which probably doesn't mean a whole lot to a home, home owner, but it certainly means a lot to a corporation. So hopefully there will be better days ahead. Thank you. John, what would you do to bring new businesses to the South Side Sheboygan Business Park? I think advertising and promotion is uh, the one way to do it, and uh, not necessarily just doing it within Sheboygan, but uh, you have to look at all forms of uh, promoting uh, in order to do that. I'm sure there's people in our city currently that don't know what's going on in that area. I, actually, my business is located across the street from the area we're talking about. And, I have people ask me all the time what's going on over there, and then I explain to them what's going on. But um, not everybody knows about it. Uh, there's a lot of businesses that I'm sure wouldn't mind going in there. But I think uh, looking beyond the city of Sheboygan to attract business in there is one way to really do that. And all different forms of advertising pay in different uh, different ways um, to do that. So it's looking at what, uh, you know, the forms of advertising that business owners are gonna look at and listen to. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And our final question is, how can the city generate revenue other than increasing property taxes? John. Well, actually that goes to, uh, to all the things that we've already been talking about. Uh, getting businesses to fill those empty spots, getting businesses to fill the empty spot that we're, uh, that we're creating on Indiana Avenue. That's uh, gonna bring in more tourism dollars, taking care of the uh, lakefront and more recreational opportunities. It's gonna bring in those more tourism dollars, uh, both the city and the county. And uh, I don't want to see my property taxes go up no more than, than anyone else here. Thank you. Roberta? Um, the way to not increase taxes is to increase the base of the taxpayers. So if we've got a larger tax base, we can have more revenue and spread spread it out so that not the same people aren't being asked to do more and more and more with their slice of the tax base. So uh, attracting new businesses, uh, attracting those people who want to live in those apartments so that they come here and they spend their money here. Also attracting visitors, uh, the Visitor and Convention Bureau and all of the recreational and um, attractive things in our community. So um, we, have to, we have to look at the income side of the revenue when we talk about, the income side of the balance sheet when we talk about not wanting our tax base, our taxes to, to expand. Thank you. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Dulcie Johnson and you'll be able to make your final statements. Thank you. 
Thank you, Roberta and John, for participating in the forum. Thank you, Margaret, as our moderator, and Eleanor as our timekeeper. This concludes our event. Um, we want to remind our audiences to remember to vote on April 6th. Your vote is your voice. And my all feeling has always been, if you don't vote, you can't complain. <laughs> Thank you, and good night. Um, also, I will tell you that um, WSCS will be running um, this forum throughout their schedule until the election. And you can also view it on WSCS Sheboygan um, YouTube and Facebook. So thank you and have a good evening.